Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Still Learning Live. Um, this is the second in a series of four events which aim to give you an inside track on how creatives shape their career and the role that learning has played in that. So as the title suggests, the theme running through this series is learning. Um, and as the first DNAD president from education and as a design educator, I'm Dean at Central St. Martins in the UK, it's a theme that I'm passionate about and that I believe is kind of inherently creative. Learning is this inherently creative act. And I don't think we talk enough about it and about how messy it can be and about how learning doesn't just happen in a place of learning, like a college or a studio or a university. So the aim of this series is to be nosy really and to find out something about the individual learning journeys of some amazing creative people. Over the course of the series, we've heard from, or we will be hearing from four creatives in total. And last time we heard from Lydia Pang, an amazing creative director, and you can still see that talk, uh, that conversation on DNAD's website. But tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tamrat Amaize from incredible US agency Collins, uh, who I must add were DNAD's most awarded agency last year in our awards. Um, and Tamara, I'm so excited to have you here today because you are head of strategy at Collins, creative strategy. And I think this is a, an area that is really underexplored um, as an area of, of kind of it, activity within creative industries and creative practice. And I don't think it's something that in design education we talk about very much either. So I'm hoping that tonight we can not just find out about you and your particular learning um, and your journey, but also unpack something of what being a creative strategist involves and what that actually means. So a huge warm welcome to you. It's lovely, lovely to be talking to you this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat. I hope I can shed some light on at least my journey and maybe dis demystify strategy a little bit as well um, so that people get a sense of what it is strategists do and how critical and crucial it is to creative work. Lovely. Well, our conversation this evening is going to have three parts to it. So we're going to talk first about looking back and finding out something about how you got to where you are now and how you discovered this area of, of creative strategy and perhaps something about the inspiration or the, the people that have been kind of formative in that journey. And then the second section we're gonna talk about today and what you're doing now um, and the learning that is perhaps part of what you're doing day to day and also for us to learn from you more about creative strategy. And then the final section is called still learning, because this is where it's going to be interesting to find out about where your inspiration comes from and the things that you're still learning and helping us look outward and, and kind of forward in terms of learning going forward. So let's begin. And just to remind okay. our audience um, that we will, we'd love to have your questions so that I can put them to Tamarat as we're speaking. So please do send your questions in as well. Um, let's begin. Tamrat, tell me something about your learning journey. What was it that 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 happened in your in your early life that was formative in in you becoming the person you are today? <laughs> so I was actually thinking a lot about this last night. Um, candidly, I was putting together some visuals to share and to send to you all. And it occurred to me, though I knew this, but I um, I never really thought about it until, you know, getting ready for this conversation, that TV has always been very influential in how I thought about my role in the world. And particularly, there are three big shows that and this is, <laughs> I've actually never said, I've said this out loud to a few people, but I've never said this out loud to a forum of this size so i'm a bit embarrassed but i'm going to own it i remember being in the shower when i was about 12 or 13 or 14 years old 
and thinking, okay, what am I going to do with my life? And I'm a child of immigrant parents. And so if you have immigrant parents from certain parts of the world, my parents are from East and West Africa. There are really three professions you can have. Doctor is at the top of the list. Engineer is, or some sort of scientific um, exploration is very close, second. And then far down third is some type of business person, lawyer, or something in business in which you know your bills are going to be paid. That's sort of the the spectrum. And so I was thinking, you know, medicine, my dad is a doctor, but there were three shows that I loved watching. One was Felicity. It's about a girl who lived in California who bucked her parents' expectations and she moved to New York to go to university. I also lived in California and I was also influenced by that to go to New York for university. I didn't tell my parents that I applied to the schools that I applied to and I got an early decision, so I kind of had to go. I also really loved, for American audiences, Law & Order SVU, which is a huge deal here. It's, I think, on its 25th season, but it's all about investigation and uh, following clues. And I was particularly excited by forensic pathology. So, uh, you know, the person who works in the morgue, who's trying to figure out the crime by investigating the dead body. And then there's a third show, which was called The Practice, which is about lawyers. And these three shows really shaped what I did uh, after I turned 18. I moved to New York and I went to school at New York University. I was a pre-med because I had the thought that I was going to be um, a forensic pathologist. And then when I realized I didn't actually want to go into medicine, I didn't want to work in a morgue actually because I didn't think anyone would get to see my outfits. And I thought that was the biggest crime ever. I thought, okay, then I'll go to law school because I love law or I love you know, the practice of law. But what these three things actually showed me is that I'm a very curious person and I love to find things out. I love to investigate. I love to decipher. And that's what really formed the things that I knew I needed to pursue. Anything that would allow me to unleash my curiosity and apply that. And so though TV, which sounds like a really funny influence in a way, led me to certain places and certain professions that then led me to other professions. What it really uncovered is that I loved following curiosity and that's what I needed to continue to maintain in my life to be happy and hopefully successful. That's really fascinating, but also I'm sure we'll be striking a chord with lots of our audience that there are really um, there are really formative influences, aren't there, that come through popular media, uh, when, particularly when we're young. Um, tell us something then about law and how did you go from, from there to where you are now? So I went to um, school at University of New York, NYU, and then directly afterwards, because again, remember, immigrant parents, particularly very strict father, I had to go to grad school right after. I remember being on the phone with him and saying, I think I want to take a year off between graduating. And he said, you're not qualified to do anything. What would you do? You have to go back to school, which I would say to others watching, don't let anyone tell you you're not qualified. You're probably not yet, but you have to have experience and get experience to become qualified. And one of my biggest regrets is that I did go back to school right away, right from undergrad into a grad program for law school. And I wish that I had explored more, either gone, continued to pursue education in the way that I wanted to, or gone out into the world um, and explored and followed my curiosity from there. Because learning comes from all aspects. It doesn't necessarily come from a classroom, though foundational learning is very helpful. But once you reach a point where you need to learn from the real world, you need to learn from work experience, whatever that work experience is, you're always learning in every capacity. So suffice it to say, I did go to grad school right away and I hated it. I wasn't ready to be in a rigorous program again. My mind wasn't ready. I wasn't in happy with the school I was in. And so I wanted to get back to, um, to the real world. And I was also in the LA, so I wanted to get back to New York. And a friend of mine was working for a branding firm at the time. And I said, I wanted to get back. I was talking to her and she said, why don't you try to get a job here. And this was back in the early days of 
of Google. So I literally Googled what is branding because I didn't know what it was and I wanted to get a job, but I was really just needing to figure out, you know, what I was going to be doing until I found out what I really wanted to do. I Googled branding and it looked interesting. Um, but more importantly, I just wanted to get back to the city and I got the job. Um, and I started in program management, which is the client services role that ushers clients in through different projects and different stages of the project from the beginning stage, the fact finding stage, and that's often in strategy, but it's, you know, cross discipline through strategic development, through design, through verbal identity, through deployment and implementation and putting the new brand out into the world. And it was there that I learned so much about relationships. I learned so much about um, interacting with clients and their needs, how to interact on an interpersonal level, as well as um, on a level where you're helping someone at the highest stakes of their job, help them move the needle for their business. And it, that experience taught me so much more than I think what I may have thought I was learning in a more formulaic and uh, formal setting in university. Because I was really putting my skills and my um, practice of interacting to work. I really was learning how to interact with people, my colleagues, our clients, understanding how to my, find my way through ambiguity and do that as a team. It was invaluable as a young person to be thrown into those situations. And the seat at the table that I was invited to allowed me to absorb from people so much more um, further along in their careers for me that those people actually became very influential in the trajectory of my career, my life today, and I consider them lifelong mentors, actually. That, that is a really interesting link to what you were talking about in terms of the curiosity, you know, your interest in curiosity that you'd identified coming through those TV influences too. And it sounds like the, the experience that you had um, of kind of being able to apply that, putting it to work, as you were saying, um, was incredibly valuable. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the people then. It's really interesting that you identify uh, and, and call some of those figures mentors. You know, how, how, how did those relationships kind of develop in a way? I, th I think if you're a young creative, I'm thinking of some of the people on this um, kind of call may be interested in, in how you build those relationships and, and whether they happen organically or whether it's something that you have to be quite strategic about um, and you identify those people who may be useful or who are particularly good at, at supporting your learning. Can you, can you tell us something about that? Yeah, I will say that there are probably, this sounds ir ironic to say, but there are probably people who are a lot more strategic than I am in how they cultivate relationships and who they identify as people that they should um, you know, get close to and learn from. <laughs> I usually, I usually leave that to the waste. I usually never think about that in the moment. I'm thinking about the people who pique my personal curiosity. And I've been lucky enough that those people often have the most to teach me, despite their particular level or who they are in an organization or, or what they've, uh, done. And the, um, the funny thing about that question that you're about to ask, or you ask, is that I, so I was a young program manager in this branding firm, and I was put onto a project with um, a director of strategy. And he actually wasn't <laughs> the most popular uh, director at the, at the company. Um, he wasn't on the most exciting or sexy projects, but I was very inspired by his mind and his approach to problem solving. And he felt strategically and creatively so different than everyone, all the other strategic directors in the, in the um, company. And we were kind of the misfits of, of the group uh, because we were working on something that was, you know, others thought was quite dry and boring, but it was a lot of problem solving. And it was a lot of problem solving with really, um, high yield returns for our clients business, but it wasn't something that would have a lot of um, exposure out into the world. A lot of what we were doing was behind the scenes. And, and so I say that to bring up the fact that his enthusiasm 
for what we were about to do and what we could create and develop on behalf of our clients, the problems we could solve for them. That was ignored by so many other, you know, of my younger peers who, you know, were really excited to work with the strategists on the big clients and the creatives on the big clients. And so when I started working with him, because the, it was just the two of us, I had to really do a lot to help him strategically. He didn't have any other strategy resources. And so I started picking up, you know, little bits and pieces here and there after my account work was done, usually in the evenings at home, trying to help him um, get deliverables ready. And in that process, uh, there was some point where we had to go to our CEO and sort of talk about and plead our case for getting more strategic resources on, on this project, on this deep relationship that we had cultivated with this really big client. Um, and because it was, again, not a shiny, sexy object, if you will, of a client and of a project, we felt like we really had to go into the CEO and say, this is what we need, help us get these resources internally. And so I was at the front of that conversation asking for another strategist. I said, you know, it's just our director and myself, I'm program managing, he's the strategist, we need someone to support him, he's working late hours, so am I trying to help him? And the CEO looked and said, well, I don't see why you need any more than two strategists. And I said, you're absolutely right. That's what I'm trying to ask for. I need another strategist so we can have two on the team. And he said, well, you're the other strategist. And I thought, okay, well, he really doesn't know who I am. He's a big, big wig CEO and I'm just some young kid. So he probably doesn't know my role, even though I thought he did. I said, no, I'm the program manager. I'm working you know, on the account side. I'm just doing some strategy stuff at night. And he said, I've seen the work that you do. You're a strategist. Why don't you just do strategy? And it was in that moment where I had someone articulate what I was already feeling and maybe I didn't recognize it or I didn't want to admit it or I didn't want to, um, or I needed some sort of validation externally. But when he said that to me, it made a huge mind shift in what I thought my capabilities were and my abilities uh, in the work were. And it also gave me the permission to ask for a formal role change, even though that's what I had wanted. And I had identified pretty early that I wanted to work in strategy. I knew that that was in, innately how my mind worked and the ways that I liked to use my curiosity to solve problems and develop systems for thinking and frameworks and approaches um, that I was applying in my role as a program manager, but I was really excited about how I could do that for a client's business. And hearing someone identify that and validate that at that level also hearing my strategic, my director of strategy who I was working with echo that and say, I think that's great, let's do that. She's already been helping and working alongside me. Those two voices literally, quite literally changed the trajectory of my career. And I count those two as mentors. Uh, I worked closely with them after that. And if it weren't for them, I might not be here or it might've taken me longer to get here than, I, than it has. Thank you for sharing that because I think there may be uh, a number of people uh, watching for whom that's familiar. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of those are women. I think there is something that I see in some of the young creatives and the, the students that I teach that there is still something incredibly powerful about that validation or, or recognition from somebody that kind of confirms your it, it, yeah, it validates what it is that you're doing. And I think um, I, I think it's also important as um, kind of more mature creatives or as figures in the creative industry to recognize the power one has also to positively reinforce for those younger creatives what we see in them and, and, and where talent is, is, is coming through and is evident because um, it's not always possible to, to, to recognize that on your own terms, or as you say, it's accelerated by, um, by somebody else's reinforcement. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, Tamara, can we move on to where you are now? Um, because I think the question that is top of my head and when we had our kind of pre-chat ahead of tonight, I, I confessed that I was still slightly mystified by what a creative strategist does and, and, and in a way intimidated because I think it's such a 
um, an important and complex role. But I think it would be really interesting just to unpack what is creative strategy and what does a head of creative strategy do? I'll start with what is creative strategy? Because I really would like to demystify that and ensure that no one feels intimidated by that. Because in a way, we're all strategists and we're all creative strategists. In that, in my role as a strategist, when I'm working with a client or when I'm working on a project, I have three stages that I'm trying to move through and sometimes come back to. The first is defining or understanding what's the real question that I'm trying to answer. Because sometimes you don't actually know what you're trying to answer until you ask more questions to form the real right question. Once you form that right question, then the next stage is now how do I define the inputs or identify the inputs that will help me answer that question? This is where the curiosity comes in as well, right? What is it that I need to learn that's gonna help me answer that question? And how do I even structure the way that I learn? And what I mean by that is, if you think about research, there are many ways to do research, but part of answering your question is understanding what might be the right ways for me to structure research practices so that I can find the best, most compelling answer to this question. That, the answer that comes at things from many angles. And sometimes trying to get at something from an unexpected angle yields the best sort of insights. So if I were to speak more plainly and not so, you know, uh, esoterically up here, let's say you're trying to understand kids because kids have been really top of mind for me. A, I have a toddler, so I'm watching one all the time now. Um, and I think that kids' brands are probably the hardest brands to work on. I've worked on a couple in my career because you're so far away from that stage of life. And there are many things and many sort of um, consumer sort of products and experiences that are targeted to adults. So it's really easy to sort of think about yourself in that role. Um, but being a kid is almost like watching an alien because the world has shaped us as adults so far away from that. So there was a project that I had to do where we had to understand uh, gaming for kids. And I didn't know what the actual question is until I actually started going out and spending time with kids, watching them play video games, which on its face, you would think, okay, that's the best type of research to do. If you're trying to work on a gaming product for kids, go watch kids play video games. But again, learning what you need to know to ask the right questions is part of the whole experience. And as I watched them play video games, I thought, and I went into their homes and I talked to their parents and I went to their rooms and watched them. I asked them if they would let me watch them play anything else, any other games they wanted to play or whatever they would do for free time. It was in that process of observing them play in general, outside of the specific focal point that I think my client was looking for, that I recognized the insight that actually changed the trajectory of my client's problem and their business and the answer that I brought to them, which was that the game, the video game that they were playing was just one aspect of what they thought play was and that they were looking for areas and moments in which they could break rules and play without boundaries and push limits. And if I had just watched them play video games, I might not have observed that. But once I got out from behind the TV and out from behind them on their controller and got out into the world with them, into their backyards, into their brothers and sisters rooms or living rooms and watched how they jumped off of couches, watched how they you know, went down the slide the wrong way purposely, watched how they literally pushed limits. I understood that the way that we were approaching this project was not all wrong, but it could come at it from a very different way. But I had to learn how to ask the right questions and how to learn how to learn in a different way, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And that curiosity um, sounds like it's about the way in which you um, 
you engage in that inquiry. So I think one of the things that's interesting to me is that one might think that a strategist sits behind a desk and you're saying the opposite. It's also about getting out there and, and discovering the questions you need to ask by being out in the field, by being with these people uh, and, and immersed. Yeah. That's Absolutely. really interesting. I mean, COVID notwithstanding, <laughs> the best yeah. place for a strategist to be is out into the in the world. And I, I failed to mention that third stage, but being out in the world to understand how to continuously learn and ask the right questions and investigate, which is why Law & Order SVU was such a big <laughs> influence mm -hmm. for me, allows you to then come back to your desk and create and define to really articulate now what is the insight that underpins what we're trying to build from a strategic perspective. What is the role that this brand needs to play in the world for its audiences? How do we identify what these audiences are seeking based on what we've learned? And then the role that the brand needs to play in response to that. And by understanding that and defining that, then you can define the ways in which the brand experience or the brand engages with those audiences, the experience it creates for those audiences to make them um, excited, inspired, to compel them to choose and engage with the brand, that all comes from learning, right? From asking the right questions, from going out, going to unexpected places and investigating, asking why, 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 until you can't ask why anymore. And then saying, okay, I've got all these inputs. Now let me put them together, sort of like a puzzle and see how they work together. And what is the thing that makes this the most exciting based off of what I've learned? So the other thing that I'd like to ask about in relation to what you're saying there is that it sounds like, or the implication is, that there is also in every creative strategy project a lot of learning that has to happen with the client or for the client. So you're also the role in the role of, of helping them learn. Can you tell us something about how that happens? Absolutely. That is probably... The thing that I'm always surprised by as well, because, you know, as a strategist, a creative strategist and in client services, something that I always like to say to keep the, to make my clients feel confident in the process is that they're the experts in their business and I'm the expert in brand. And what we're trying to do is a transfer of knowledge between each other. I'd like you, the client, to teach me about your business. And I would like to teach you about how others in your category and even beyond your category are doing things um, that we can learn from together, but also the things that you, your audiences are saying or doing or behaving that you may not be paying attention to because you're so focused, rightfully so, on your business that I can help unearth, um, reveal to you. But in that process, it is a lot of, a tr it is a transfer of knowledge, but I'm also teaching the clients or helping them learn about their business in a new way, helping them learn about their audiences in a new way, um, helping them learn about the attitudes, the behaviors, the motivations of their audience that they may not be um, specifically attuned to because they're focusing on their audience in one narrow space or category. But if you look at how that audience behaves across categories in the real world, um, outside of what your business is, you can glean a lot of that, uh, these insights from that behavior that then are applicable to what the client's business is. So not only am I helping them learn about that and a different aspect of their business, maybe in a deeper way, but I'm also helping them learn about the power of brand, right? And what that means outside of business jargon, it's the power of a compelling reason, right? We all need reasons to do something. And whatever the reason is and whatever it is you're trying to do, even if it's the most boring thing, if it compels you to do something, it's a valid reason. And that's what brand is. It's a reason to choose. It's a reason to have a relationship. It's a reason to keep coming back. And if I can help our clients see the power that their most valuable asset brand is in helping to get their audiences engaged, involved, committed. That's a huge learning um, for them, a huge lesson and an ongoing learning for them that A, they'll take wherever they go, but B, can 
really change the course of their business and how they deploy their brand for their business. I have some questions coming in, but just before I go to them, I think there is something else that I'd like to, to know is what happens when you hit resistance? And I'm imagining that resistance is part of the learning process. I mean, I think thinking of many of us when we learn, there's that point of kind of feeling, you know, it can be uncomfortable, can't it, learning? And yeah. I guess what happens when when clients, you know, are either resistant or I guess the other way of asking that question is, are there some conditions for learning that you have identified are helpful to being able to kind of to, to engage clients in some of the more uncomfortable learning that you might want to take them through? Oh, that's a great question because there are loads, <laughs> loads of lessons I've learned <laughs> along the way. Um, I think it's a, a great way to start that is talking about the conditions for learning. And something that I've recognized in working with clients and helping them learn in the way that's best for them is to recognize that the stakes are high for them. Often when we're working with a client who is engaging in developing a new brand or rebranding, refreshing, it's an act of creation on their part and on ours. And creating is hard. It checks your ego many times. It is scary. There is, besides the risk to what you're putting out into the world, there's the risk to your own confidence. And when I say your, I mean, not just ours, but on the client's behalf, whether this is a founder, whether this is a head of marketing, whether this is um, a, a VP of design. And so, this, sound, this may sound corny, but I think it's absolutely true. Having empathy for the role that they're in and their experience and the difficulty that creation as um, an act is, helps to then recognize how to help them learn in the way that makes sense for them and meets them where they are. So it's really important to identify, does this person, do the people that I'm having, I'm developing a relationship with, do they, would they be more comforted by theoretical learning, right? So learning about it in a more formulaic, formal, um, uh, rote way where they're, we're teaching them through frameworks and practices and validated by uh, best known models. Is this a group that would be more enthused, inspired and comforted by learning about these these theories that are out in the world that are practiced by big sort of mentor brands or peers they need to see how it works in action and learn from that through case studies is this a client for whom you need to listen to them a lot and what i mean by that we should listen to everybody but where you develop you start from developing a relationship first because you learn so much i learn so much just by listening to them their day-to-day -day plights their day-to-day -day issues what they're trying to achieve internally their obstacles and by developing a, a really intimate relationship first, and then from there, a lot of high touch collaboration, perhaps that's the best way that my client learns because I'm doing something with them and they feel like they're in the making together. So I think the biggest answer to your question is understanding what those conditions are by really understanding who you're partnering with and how they best learn and what, uh, how you can meet them where they are and then develop and design those conditions for them so that you can guide them along the process and we can learn together. Because in every project, I'm not only learning from my client, I'm learning from their space, I'm learning from their dynamics, and I'm always, always transforming where there's no end point where I feel like, okay, I've learned everything. It's more that the more I learn, the more I recognize there is to learn and the more that I can challenge my expectations so that I'm learning anew every time. That sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook, I'm sure, but you know, there is no end no, point, right? Lovely. You're always becoming. I think that's really lovely. And I think it's a really kind of clear articulation. And it makes me think you're an educator as much as a strategist, you're an educator. And that's, you know, it. it's fascinating because it's a little bit like what you're talking about with clients saying sometimes you you look outside of your field or your kind of area in order to be able to to look at examples of where 
you know, I think what you were saying was that you could look to a different sector of branding or a different um, a different area to help a client see something about their own area. And absolutely. you're making me think about education differently. And I absolutely love that. Um, I'm going to go to some questions, um, Tamra, because we've had some come in. Um, and one of the questions from Maria um, relates to what we've just been talking about. Um, and she asks that since your work is, is involves learning about the client and the client's business, what was the project that gave you or that you most enjoyed learning about? So what was the business, I think, the client business that you've most uh, you've, you've had most pleasure in learning about what they do about their area and about a different field from your own? Hmm. <laughs> this is going to sound like a cop out answer, but there has yet to be a client's business that I haven't been fascinated by once I got in and that there is not one single business where I'm like, oh, that was the most exciting. It's often, and I'm, I promise this is not, I don't know if I can say this, I'll say BS, <laughs> but <laughs> the clients, the businesses or the sectors or the specific industries that seem like they are the most dry and the least interesting are actually the ones for me that are the most um, revealing because there are so many layers of decision making and actors and behaviors that get ignored that that's where I find that there's the most room for um, real creative development and definition. What I mean by that is so for a long, early part of my career and for many years, for about six years, I was working with Intel and I was working on, working, working on the microprocessor business, right? How to compel choice for such a small ingredient in an overall system, arguably for most people, the least exciting component of that. But in understanding all the things that go into having that small ingredient run the machine, run the system, and also to define how to learn about the role that that small ingredient plays in the overall decision. That was so interesting in terms of developing research worldwide to understand what role does a microprocessor actually play? How do we quantify the role that it plays in purchasing a computer, right? How do we actually find out what is the percentage it plays in a consumer's mind and saying, this is how much importance I'm going to a tribute to this small component, if at all. And then how to use that knowledge to then define its role from a brand perspective, not just a functional product perspective in the machine, but the brand perspective. What story can we tell? What value can we define for our audiences in the way that it makes the most sense for them so that we can actually influence how they choose and how they use? And so that was it's not the, you know, I don't have a favorite, but that was when I realized that you really can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a business by its campaign. You can't judge it by, you know, its awareness. Um, but you have to go inside and understand the layers that go into um, the role that it plays in the world and the value, the potential value that can be articulated about that role. And that's to me what I find the most exciting. I hope that answered Maria's question. Maria, let us know in the chat. Great answer. I think that's a great answer. Um, and it reminds me of something my mum used to say, which is um, it takes a boring person to find something boring that like there's always something interesting. You have to you have to keep keep looking. Um, yeah. Now, we've got a couple of other questions here. There's there's one which kind of goes back, I think, to, to some of the things you were saying right at the beginning of, of, of this session, um, because Elena has asked, is there something you recommend someone who wants to work in strategy um, can do at work to show that this is something that they can do it? So I think that's kind of referring to the fact that the work you were doing um, at the point at which you were kind of validated as, as already doing strategy obviously was linked to that area. But I'm, I'm guessing there may be people on this call who don't feel that they're necessarily in an area where that would get recognized. So is there anything that you think they could do to demonstrate that they have aptitude in that way? Yeah, I, I think 
I, I want to answer that in two ways from a, um, a broad macro perspective and then specifically in the work. I would just say generally, if there's anything that you want to get into that you feel like you haven't been invited to or you don't have the, um, the expertise or the experience, just insert yourself. <laughs> I think no matter what field you're in, what uh, profession you're in, if you want to help, there are very few people who are going to reject help if it's well-meaning and it's additive. So insert yourself, offer, volunteer, ask to do something, ask to help out to do some extra, right? That first and foremost proves that you're hungry and you're excited and you're interested and that you're willing to go out on a limb and contribute. And you're willing to have your contribution evaluated. It might be useful, it might not be, but you yourself will learn from the evaluation of that contribution. And even if it's deemed not useful, you will, you will have learned from the process of putting something together. You'll have learned from the process of inserting yourself and raising your hand. You'll have learned from so many different dimensions. So in general, just insert yourself, ask if you can help and ask what you can do. And if you're told that there's nothing you can do, there's no way you can help, then help anyway. Do it for yourself, offer it up. And if it's rejected, at least again, you'll have learned from that process and that practice. Then more specifically, I would say, now this might relate to, you know, budding strategists or people who want to enter into strategy and they're in this space, the first foray into um, contributing or to helping or to sort of um, trying your hand is to ask questions and then go find some answers. Try to understand what the bigger question is that needs to be asked that maybe no one is asking or go out and try to find those answers for yourself. Do secondary research, reading. I'm so, you know, when I started, this is dating myself and I don't even feel like I'm that old, but the internet is so much better than it was in when I started in 2006. <laughs> so 2005. Oh, yeah. And so <laughs> you can learn so much from your seat, right? You can learn so much from behind the screen. You can go to so many different places. You can read so many articles and journals and watch interviews now where you can actually find a lot of data to start answering some of those questions and to learn how to ask better questions. And then you can go out into the world and do some real world investigation. Let's say your team is working on a project and it's about, you know, I'm trying to think of something that we were working on a while ago, beverage, water beverages in sales, right? Like how to think about getting people to buy water in a different way. One of the ideas I had right before we, you know, went into lockdown for the pandemic was to literally just go and sit in the cooler aisle in our local grocery store and watch how people made those decisions on shelf, what they were evaluating, start asking people, you know, politely. And if they want to chat, I'd learn from that. But go and put yourself in situations in which you can ask questions, observe, learn, collect data, and then synthesize it. So Elena, if I could an answer your question as specifically as possible, I would say insert yourself, number one, and then go and ask questions and answer them for yourself and offer them up to your teams and see if it's helpful in any way. And even if it's not, you'll have learned from the specific process yourself. I think that's great advice. And that hopefully answers a very similar question that came in from Laura. So I hope that's helpful for you, Laura, too. Um, let's move on to the, the final section, um, which is still learning. And I'm actually going to go to, we've got a couple of questions from uh, people on this call that I think are really relevant to this section. So as we start talking about still learning, what you're still learning and where that learning comes from, we have a, a question from Shania um, who asks how, what happens or how do you avoid kind of taking cliche directions and what happens if there are no new insights? So I guess that, that around that, there is something around how you, how you stay fresh, you know, how, how do you stay yeah. fresh? And there's a second question, which I think is linked here, um, which is about how you continue to grow as a creative strategist. Okay. So if I heard the first, the, the, the first part of the question, <clears throat> what do you do when there are seemingly no new insights to learn? Is that? 
Yeah, I think so. I think probably it's, it, yeah, if, if you if you find there are no new insights or you yeah. think you find that there are no insights. I love that question because I think that any, any creative person who's problem solving will inevitably reach a point where they think that there's nothing new and you'll probably become demoralized and a little bit sad and you'll feel like you hit uh, a wall and say there's nothing new here i don't know i'm gonna have to contrive something like there's nothing to pull here and i think that is that's false it's probably comes from an area of um you know, really hitting some blockades and also potentially self doubt. And I don't say that lightly and I don't say that dismissively either. I'm saying that maybe from my own experience, it means that I have to push harder, which is difficult and uncomfortable, which often learning is because you feel like you don't yet know where there is to go. And if you can't see the path ahead, you can trick yourself into thinking that there is no path ahead, if that makes sense. And so, the answer to that actually leads to one of the other questions, how to stay fresh. To find and forge that path ahead, to find new insights, because there are always new insights. If there weren't new insights, that would mean that there's a limit to our learning. And there, that I believe that can't be the case. <laughs> As human beings, I don't believe there's a limit to our learning because there's so many things we don't know. But when you feel like there's a limit, when you feel like there's nothing new, the thing to do, I found, is to go in the complete opposite direction. It's kind of like, you know, if you've lost, if you were a kid and you lost something and your parent says, where is the place you think you would least expect to find it? Start there. That's what I do when I need um, an infusion of new stimulation and if I need to stay fresh and I need to find a new way and a new path forward, I go someplace that makes absolutely no sense and I start there. So if I were to speak more practically, if I were working on a, biz, a, par, a piece of um, a client's business in a space where I feel like, oh, this is trodden, well-trod territory, right? Um, everything that's been done and has been said or can be said has been said. I think about elements of behavior in this space and what's a place a category, a sector, an industry that seems like it's totally unrelated, but where I might see the same patterns of behavior. So for example, if you're thinking about finances, there are patterns of behavior in finance where people are very much bogged down by shame because their finances are not in the place that they'd want them to be they're bogged down by insecurity because they feel like they might need to be in a better place financially than they are and they don't wanna share that, right? And, and, and that limits them from taking certain actions that they need to take. They may be uh, confronted by feelings of inferiority or marginalization being shut out of the system because they didn't learn something in school and their peers have. And if you think about that and those behaviors and those feelings, there is a proxy for where people you know, have that sa those same emotions or are working through those things, perhaps in therapy, right? In relationships, when people are thinking about familial relationships, romantic relationships, they feel insecure, they feel shame for feeling certain feelings, they feel like they can't communicate or they feel like they are um, at a disadvantage because they haven't been given certain tools. You can look to a certain place and find inspiration there and say, what can we learn from the, the patterns and the tools and the skills in that space that we can apply here? And how can we then think and help our clients in this financial space think about their product and their offering differently that speaks to the insights of that behavior, but takes the language and the vocabulary and the uh, exercises from a totally different space and apply them. So that's a, you know, kind of far out example, but a way that I try to keep fresh is I try to go to a totally different place and look for parallels, look for connections, and then bring them back and try to see if I can forge a new path. That's fantastic. And I think that partly does answer Sharon's question about what what you think helps you grow as a creative strategist. Um, 
before I come to, to another question on that, there's a there's a great question here from Shahada, and I hope I'm saying your name right, Shahada. And she wondered whether you could speak a little bit on navigating the design world as a woman of color um, and any barriers that you faced in having peers or clients trust your point of view. Mm, I love that question because I often feel alone and i don't mean that in a i don't mean lonely i mean um literally i'm often either one of few if not the only woman in a in a room not not with my peers per se but often you know in a client's setting um almost always the only black woman black person and so it's been really important for me to, as I've gotten older, to lean into that. And what I mean is that when I was younger, I thought that I needed to speak a certain language um, and, I, and identify with often white men. So watch the things that they were watching or speak in the, in the way that they were speaking about certain um, trends or behaviors or um, topics of interest. Um, and that A, just actually was not me, but B, that, that negated the contribution that I could bring, which is a different perspective. And so as I become older, and now particularly in my role as a head of strategy as well, I'm very, uh, very focused on always ensuring that we're bringing multiple perspectives to a table. And so in the way that I'm hoping to build out a team and continue building out a team to account for different perspectives of all types and also ensure that I'm always bringing my unique authentic perspective because my life lived is very different from others. All of ours are, but especially in the mainstream, my connection to my particular culture, being a, a woman, being a woman of color, being a woman who in the US is born to immigrant parents from East and West Africa, there are different things that perspectives I can bring that shape the work. And also by not being in the majority in the mainstream, I can bring a perspective that ensures that we're checking the mainstream as well, that we're not leaving anyone behind and we're pushing back on what is seen as expected or assumed or um, the standard, if you will. But the other aspect to that question is, you know, what I did early on in my career as well is seek out the um, camaraderie of others who I also felt were probably feeling alone, right? Those of us who felt like we weren't part of the mainstream, how do we come together and uh, learn from each other and find uh, solidarity as a group, uh, learn from each other's experiences, learn to navigate through each other and find where possible those mentors um, who are maybe a few steps ahead of you that can help guide you or help at least shed some light on what you can expect so that um, you're learning from their uh, challenges, but you're also learning through their successes and what sort of doors they've helped to open for others. Thank you. Um, I think that leads into Latouche's question. Uh, and first of all, uh, Latouche is showing a lot of love for your orange jacket. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and the question from Latouche is about um, why you chose to work at Collins and what you most enjoy about being a strategist. Okay, love that. I'll, I'm gonna start with the strategist first because that leads into why I chose to work at Collins. So what I love most about being a strategist is that, and I, I might've said this in the beginning, it allows me to apply my curiosity, my natural inquisitiveness. Just a quick little story. My husband always gets mad because we'll be, going someplace and I might strike up a conversation with someone and we end up talking for like five, seven minutes, which can be a long time when someone's waiting for you. And I'll walk away and I'm like, oh my God, that person wouldn't stop talking. And he says, well, you were asking them so many questions. Like you didn't let on that you wanted the conversation to end. So that natural inquisitiveness that I have, being a strategist allows me to apply that. And being a creative strategist allows me to apply that curiosity in a way that I can define and develop and create something 
from that curiosity, to not just ask questions for the sake of asking and understanding, but to also build something from that understanding that can have great meaning in the world. And, it, and I've talked a lot about clients' business, but I also want to talk about the impact that a brand can have in the world and the responsibility that a brand can have in the world by being created in a way that recognizes big questions that need to be answered, recognizes truths and insights, and then uses that recognition to play a positive force in the world. And that's what I found is possibly the biggest power that I have as a strategist is helping to shape the world in a small way, but very influential that uh, really excites me and gets me out of bed every day. It's like, what, what am I helping this brand to do in the world? And so that leads me to why I, I, I work at Collins and why I chose and am lucky enough to work at Collins is that beyond the, um, how do I say it? external success that it seems like Collins has, which we do, but I don't, you know, not wanting to put a lot of stock, too much stock into that. But beyond that, it's a recognition for the influence and the responsibility we have as practitioners of and behind brands. Meaning when clients come to us with their businesses, the, what we're trying to do as a company is really help them understand the impact that they are going to make or the potential impact that they can make and the responsibility that they have as, as conscious actors in business. And our job and what we have decided as our sort of principles for us is that it's not about profit. It's not about money. It's not about moving the needle uh, for your P&L or contribution to your revenue. It's about value. And it's about how that value is defined and how that value changes lives. And that might sound so, uh, my, <laughs> my boss likes to say wooey in a way, right? Like that might sound like up here, but it's true in that if you think about everything you're helping a client do and the role that it can play in one person's life and can that be defined as a positive change or a negative change? Is there a positive impact that's being put into the world? Or is there something that is destroying, destructing, suppressing, um, oppressing? We can think about our role as pivotal actors in that relationship and in that exchange. And so that's the responsibility that we have. And I think at Collins, we take that responsibility very seriously. And that's how we evaluate clients that we want to work on and types of business that we want to work in. Uh, and that's what I found really exciting about Collins is that we have a huge amount of creativity and we apply that creativity for big problems and hopefully creating big solutions. That's amazing. And I can't believe looking at the time that we're at the end because there are so many more questions that I could be asking. And I know that I'm seeing questions come in from the audience, but in particular, Tamarat, I want to say that I think you've expanded certainly how I think about our responsibilities, our the application of our curiosity and the way in which actually strategy is a kind of as a way of thinking as a, a set of frameworks. And I feel like I've learned a lot tonight listening to you and I'm sure our audience have too. And thank you for being so generous with your time and your insights um, and your openness about who you are and how you do what you do, which is amazing and inspiring. So thank you so much. Well, oh, thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you guys for having me. I hope someone found even a little bit of this helpful. <laughs> I can tell from the questions coming in that, that, that they really have. So, so thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who's listened and listening and watching. Um, just a reminder that these sessions, these conversations are available online after the event. So please do watch again. There was so much in tonight's session that I want to go back and, and, and kind of engage with again. Um, so remember to go to DNAD, DNAD's website, please. I'm so excited. I'm tripping over my words. Um, and finally, a reminder that we have two more sessions in this Still Learning Live series. So um, a reminder that we have uh, next month, uh, Nick Parker, um, a, a copywriter talking about tone of voice and what it is to, to write 
in the design context. And then the following month, we have Pali Palavathanan from Templo Design, who's going to talk about being a graphic designer, and in particular, the perspective of running a design agency, which was embedded for a while in the UN. So working as a graphic designer at the service of, of a different type of client um, working with the United Nations. Um, it's been such a fascinating evening. Thank you so much, or I, I'm saying evening, it's morning for you, Tamarat. So uh, thank you for giving up your morning to us. Uh, give our love to everybody at Collins. Um, and yeah. thank you all, thank you so much. Keep learning everybody. Take care and stay mm -hmm. safe. Bye.